Hi everybody, Steve the Amateur Historian here with you, coming to you from near the intersection of Holgate and 82nd, busy through traffic. And specifically I'm here because this is the site of the Multnomah Park Cemetery. I want to say it was established in 1888, so it's a rather old one, and it's a big one as well. And the reason I'm here, I'd love to be able to do this for every video I do, but that is simply not practical. I'd never have a free moment to myself anymore. But I'm here specifically in relation to a brand new episode of Historic Murders of Portland. So, the reason I chose to begin here at Monoma Park Cemetery is obviously there's a gravestone here in relation, or actually multiple gravestones, in relation to the story I'm going to bring you. And the reason I'm starting here, as opposed to other videos, is because I actually discovered this case about a year ago, long before I conceived of this idea of doing a video series based around old murders in Portland and I was on a blog page specifically dedicated to posting about this cemetery and I they presented a case about um, two people that are buried here I actually found out three that may perceivably be related to the case but specifically two people that are buried here and a horrible event that happened way back in 1919 so I learned about this story from going on the cemetery's webpage and now I just have to find their gravestones which okay yeah section a this is where I want to be all right this actually helps me that this denotes that this is all section a and it said roughly in the middle so I'm gonna kind of start here this is I know I'm very close to where I want to be. This is really taking a lot longer than I thought it was going to. Ah, I'm so confused. It should be right here. This sucks. The diagram says it's right here and I've walked through this area like three times. And I'm in section A. The signboard up there said so. This is section A of what the grave looks like. Of course, don't want you to see the name, but yeah, I can't, I can't find it. I literally cannot find it. So here's the gravestone I'm looking for has been moved. It's not there. I just covered all of Section A. Find Grave says it's in Section A. I searched the whole area. I've looked at pictures of the gravestone. The gravestone, the last name is in big letters. So it's not one I would miss. But, um... Yeah, it's, it's not in section A, like they say. I literally covered that whole, this whole section twice over, looking at areas that weren't even anywhere near where it was supposed to be, and it ain't there. So, sorry, that was a letdown. But anyway, the grave is probably here somewhere. It's just not where they're saying it is, and I'm not going. I will be here forever. I'll be here till tomorrow morning trying to find out where that headstone is. But... Case in point, I found out about this case because this guy and his wife are supposedly buried here, along with his brother, who there is a brother that plays a role in this story, but I'm not sure if it's a specific brother. According to the picture, the main guy's gravestone is here and his brother's gravestone is literally right in front of it. But I'm talking about a case from June 19th 1919 so 6-1919 <laughs> is the case of a guy named Thomas Edwards who lived in Southeast Portland with his wife um, Ina Edwards so that's where I'm heading now just a little ways this direction 
where the events of the story unfolded. And now I'm coming to you from still southeast Portland, about a mile and a half northeast of where Multnomah Park Cemetery is. And I'm trying to get to roughly the intersection of just a little north of the intersection of Southeast 86th and Main Street. And this is an area that even today is still somewhat underdeveloped, at least as far as the streets go. There's lots of divots like that back there where it's like it's paved and then they just kind of gave up. But either way, this here is the intersection of 86th and Main Street. And if we turn and look this direction, this first house sitting at the corner, you look past it, this next house over, this kind of blue and gray house right here, this sits on the site where the Edwards family lived. Now I checked, this house was built 1951, so it's not the same house that they actually lived in, but this is the site. And as always, I try not to linger too much, but yeah, right here where this blue house is, grayish blue. So just two blocks down, two blocks north of the intersection of 86th, right there where that house was. There obviously was another house roughly on that same property. And that is where, as I said, the Edwards family lived. But come the morning of, what was it again? June. June 19th, 1919. I love that date. It's barely past the 6 a.m. hour. Thomas, his wife, and uh, their kids, they're all in the house. Start of another day, nothing seems out of the ordinary. They actually had a friend living with them who um, had essentially taken up as a boarder because they were struggling financially because Thomas had recently, uh, it seems, fallen out of work he was having some illness issues and he'd been out of work. Uh, I think he worked at an iron foundry, of which there were still a lot back then. Again, I'm passing by the house. And right here, Thomas, as the newspapers report, comes into the kitchen, his wife, or into the dining room area. His wife is sitting there. He walks in with a smile on his face like any other day. Then he pulled out a gun and shot his wife completely out of the blue. So here's where the brother comes into play. Again, the brothers, uh, oh my God, the brother's remains were apparently buried right next to his brothers because their tombstones are together. He gets a phone call from uh, Thomas Edwards. He's walked over to a neighbor's house. Very Apparently this is all done very passively, very casually. Nothing, nothing out of the norm. Almost systematic, mechanical the way he did this. And he called his brother, who I assume he was close with, or else why go out of your way? He calls his brother and tells him that he just shot his wife and that he's planning on going back home and doing the same thing to himself. And it's bizarre that he leaves the house. Uh, maybe his home didn't have a phone, I don't know. But he leaves his home to go to a neighbor's house to call his brother to tell him this. And then he hangs up. And his brother, who lives uh, about a mile away, I think he lived on Thorn Thornburn, which is over towards Mount Tabor, just this way, about a mile from here. And he tries to rush over here as quickly as possible, but he, he's just, he's too far away. The house, I can only assume, was quiet. Upon hearing the gunfire, the Edwards' children fled in absolute horror. And the neighbor who was boarding, or the, the friend who was boarding with them, said he tried to go at Edwards and stop him. But he, he it came so out of nowhere he couldn't do it, and as he tried to run and grab Edwards. He ran out of the house and that's when he went to the next door neighbor's house. So, you know, when Edwards returns to his home, it's 
it's only him and his wife, as it seems, and she's, she's laying there dead. And as the story goes, he sat down, laid down right next to her, um, you know, so they were side by side, and then he fulfilled what he said he was going to do. He pulled out a gun and shot himself. And it just, it came out of absolutely nowhere. They say, and I'm guessing this is the report from their border because he's the only one that was in the room that survived the incident. He said that Thomas Edwards walked in with a smile, like, good morning, how y'all doing? And then just pulled out a gun and shot his wife. And so it was, it was a murder-suicide and they were discovered next to each other. And it was also, I also read in one report that Thomas Edwards was apparently reading or was quoting Revelation, I think, the book of Revelation. Um, I don't know where that verification comes from. Like, after he shot himself, he just said it to himself as he was bleeding out. I don't know. Uh, which is interesting because the authorities decided he did this out of desperation. He was out of work. He had, he had poor health. I don't know if he was, you know, facing an imminent death. Um, which is why he did this, which is not justifiable by any means. Just because you're going to die, you don't take others with you. Um, so they kind of blamed it on his failing health and a lack of fulfillment or a lack of prosperity is how the newspapers put it, which is probably, you know, here's a guy who I think he was in his, he was 39, he was almost 40, and he was just working at an iron foundry and I guess that wasn't fulfilling and now he wasn't even working. And they were struggling so much that they had to take on a border. That was the official story. Now, in one of the first newspaper reports on this case, it mentioned, kind of mixed in in the middle of the article while they were reporting this, that Thomas Edwards had recently become aligned with a religious cult. And even in the aftermath, they all said that this guy was fanatically religious and that perhaps that drove him to doing this, and some, something about that drove him to do this insane act. And another newspaper uh, report ended their article by saying Thomas was known as a holy roller, which, if you don't know what that means, it's this, this, this certain type of uh, religious person who, like, you know, how they connect with God or express their connection to their religion they take to a lot of hello squirrel a lot of like physical uh, uh actions like they dance or they shake or they quiver um you know you'll see a bunch of people in a room and they're all just like wigging out and that's their that's them like they're the peak connection to their religion just letting it all out um and he was apparently uh one of these people which Especially if you're not religious, you look at these people and you think these people are out of their freaking minds. Um, I am a Catholic, and even I'm like, that seems like a lot. I'm, I'm sure that certain people connect through actions such as that. But I think there's a lot of other people that are just trying to make a big show of their religious faith by creating something that's going to get a lot of attention, by just getting crazy. I think, you know, there's, there's people that where it's legitimate, and then there's, it's just for show. But whatever the case, in Thomas Edwards' scenario, we're very much left in mystery. Again, the authorities just blamed it on his place in life, that he wasn't very fulfilled. But I'm like, why wouldn't you just fake a murder? Why, why, why would you ruin your family? Why would you kill your wife and effectively make orphans of your children if... You're just like, oh, I'm dying and I feel unfulfilled. Why wouldn't you just fake a murder and take out a big life insurance policy? You could get away with stuff like that back then. And then you could shuffle off this mortal coil. And, but your family would be well taken care of. I, I just, I don't believe what law enforcement kind of reached as I think a convenient conclusion to the matter. And I look at all these, these little interjections about how this guy, you know, saying he was, a, uh, he was aligned with a religious cult, but there's, there, there's nothing further discussed on the matter. 
except that he was with a religious cult of some kind. Well, what does that mean? What kind of a cult was it? Are we talking Charles Manson stuff? Are we talking Jonestown stuff? Is it not that chaotic? Um, and it seems like this guy was wildly, madly religious, but mad, who super adherent to the Christian faith. One of the things about being a Christian is you don't commit suicide. You also don't commit murder. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Okay, thou shalt not kill. So this guy literally sins hardcore twice by killing someone else and then killing himself. So, you know, there's a lot of mystery to this case when all is said and done. And I honestly look at this and I think there was something about this guy's perspective, his religious background, how he was taking in his religion. You know, people have used religion. They still do it today. People all over the world have used religion as a way to, uh, or like they, they let it just take too much of a grip on them. And it's driven people to do absolutely crazy things. We see that constantly, all the time in our world. And I really think there was something about this guy's mindset in relation to how fanatic he was religiously that I think that and I don't know how but I think that had a much more significant purpose towards his because it, it's completely out of the blue it's unmotivated there's no reports that his wife was cheating on him that they were unhappy in their marriage even though they were struggling at that time I think there was more to this religious angle than the authorities wanted to admit. And when you think it's a hundred years ago, I mean, that's a time where, you know, religion is a lot less popular today, but back then, religion was a big deal. You didn't question uh, the church and things like that. So when somebody hauls off and does something crazy like this, and he's got this, this particular tilt, <laughs> this particular aspect of his life where they're coming out and saying, you know, this guy was super duper religious. And then he killed himself and his wife. Um, I think that wouldn't have been received very well by the public if the authorities made that connection. But if we're honest with ourselves, I think that was a pretty significant part of it. And that is the story of the 1919 murder, a man killing his wife just completely out of the blue. Um, a lot of these cases, you have some, you have some background. There was jealousy, uh, a divorce was wanted. Something happened that shamed the man. And back in back in the old days, men didn't take getting shamed very easily. Uh, but this one, we can only theorize about this one. And I've given you kind of my general theory. I think there was something about his religious background that that really twirled him around and put him into a. Uh, a crazed place mentally to where he took just drastic action and there was no there was no hesitance the murder it seems was just methodical going over to the neighbors calling his brother just saying I killed my wife and I'm gonna do the same and it, it seemed like there was no hesitation um, like this guy was just this guy was overcome by something much more than himself is what it seems like and I, I'm not really sure crazy actions like that you can just blame it on a guy losing his job, if that was even the case. Pretty much being out of work and unhappy. So, and again, sorry, I couldn't find the grave, the grave site of these people. It was not for a lack of trying. And uh, thanks again for watching another episode in this series. I don't know why I picked crossing the freeway to end this video, but we're here, so I'm going to do it. And uh, just remember, guys, as usual, like, share, subscribe, comment, but keep it nice or I will delete it as sure as you're born. And uh, hit up my Patreon if you want to help me out that way. Thank you in advance. And until uh, next time, from standing over the freeway like an idiot, this has been Steve the Amateur Historian with another episode of Historic Murders of Portland. Catch you later.